Bonjour à tous, ici le studio de Crows en direct, en tout cas pour nous, de Dragon Meat. Et, euh, nous avons aujourd'hui avec nous euh, Kenneth Height, euh, l'auteur <rire> de Fall of Delta Green, donc la chute de Delta Green en français actuellement en financement participatif sur Game on Tabletop. Et nous avons quelques questions à lui poser. Hi Ken. Hi. Um, can you introduce yourself for our French audience? Uh, my name is Kenneth Height. I'm a role playing game designer. Uh, I've, uh, you may know me from Trail of Cthulhu and Knights Black Agents, both of which I know have French editions, and I just designed Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition, and now Fall of Delta Green. Great. Um, can you tell us, um, according to you, what, says, what sets uh, Fall of Delta Green apart from the Delta Green uh, known uh, game? Uh, I mean, much of it is the setting. It's set in the 1960s, which is a different era in a lot of ways. There's no uh, internet, there's no cell phones. You're very much sort of alone at the tip of the spear. Uh, Delta Green is uh, legal, if not entirely authorized or um, uh, acknowledged operation, which makes it part of the military bureaucracy and the intelligence bureaucracy of the era. That, of course, comes back around with the new Delta Green role-playing game, but back in the day, this is the continuity from the old OSS era at Delta Green. And so that uh, gives it a different feel from sort of classic cowboy Delta Green mm -hmm. and has uh, resonances with the modern day post-majestic uh, reunified Delta Green. Okay. Um, you talked about the, the 60s. Um, we were wondering uh, why did you choose this specific uh, period of time and did you have specific knowledge of the, that time period because the book is pretty accurate. Uh, That's what, what, are, what are some of the things that the translators noticed when they, they worked on the, on the book. Um, so yeah, um, what, what strikes you about uh, this period? Well, when uh, Arc Dream approached me at the very beginning to do the gumshoe adaptation of Delta Green, we didn't want to do another modern day one because they were doing the modern day. And so they said, how about if you do a historical setting? And they suggested the 1950s, which is another great era in Delta Green history, but I said, I'd kind of rather do the 60s for a couple of reasons. First, it's just a, a sort of a wilder period. It's more like a Lovecraftian era with the crazy cults and the uh, apocalypse of onrushing in Indochina and elsewhere. And uh, the other thing is it has a natural narrative arc because at the end of the decade in 1970, the Delta Green program is shut down. So you are literally doing a game about hubris and nemesis, the game about, you know, you, you know pride going before your fall. And so that gave it a better thematic arc than just here are 10 years during which we fought the mythos. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but this I think had a little more sort of uh, a poetic sweep to it. And then in terms of knowledge of the period, I mean, I was born in 1965. So in one sense, I know, you know, I, have a, I remember man landing on the moon and I remember Nixon, but I don't remember it really well. But I have more familiarity maybe with that era, the era before the internet than a, a younger designer might. Uh, I don't know that that makes me special. The younger designers do historical games all the time, but I have maybe a little more understanding of what Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon thought they were doing, and so it's a little easier to get that sympathy for Delta Green. Uh, it, that's just a that's just a guess, but that I think is is part of it. And then the rest, is, like you say, is just research, just mm -hmm. knowing how to not get it wrong. Okay. Um... Which parts of the book were the most enjoyable for you to write? And um, um, on the other side, uh, which, which part of the books were the most hard to, uh, the hardest parts for you to write? I mean, none of it was particularly hard to write. Uh, it, this is my th uh, third core gumshoe game. Mm -hmm. So when you've done the same thing three times in a row, it's maybe harder to get as inspired about it. But one of the fun things about Gumshoe is every time you come up with the story, uh, the setting, you have to sort of figure out how does Gumshoe fit in. And so once we figure out you have to have a military career, because this is in the era of the universal draft in America, and then you have to have a government agency because you're working for Delta Green undercover, that sort of defines that part of it. Building out the specific skill sets, the abilities for the 1960s is fun because you're like, Uh, in this case, I'm not just translating it back in the 1960s, but I'm translating it from the Delta Green role-playing game. So, what decisions did Greg and Shane make that I get to then sort of make and riff? And so I got to translate things like 
Greg Stolze's lethality rules into gumshoe, which have never been done in something like that. So it, normal gumshoe combat can range from not particularly bad to fairly bad in nice black agents, and then the addition of lethality makes it a million times worse, which is apropos for the period uh, and for the uh, Delta Green itself. And then the fun part is just making up new cults and things like that for the 1960s. So when I was thinking, well, what's our what's our crazy 60s guru going to be who's leading the kids into danger? Um, and I thought, oh, well, uh, everyone in the 60s, yeah, the Beatles put Aleister Crowley famously on um, uh, the people we like uh, in uh, Sgt. Pepper. And I thought, well, what's our sort of Crowley figure that we can use? And I thought, oh, Count Magnus from M.R. James. He never gets any love. I'll bring him back mm -hmm. and make him a 60s guru. So the, the cult of Chorazin becomes a thing. So making up those sort of cults and then fitting them into the Delta Green universe, that was, I think, the, the most fun part. Okay. Um, you talked about the, the gumshoe system. Mm -hmm. um, compared to Trail of Susan, for example, um, can you tell us about the adjustments you've made uh, to customize for, for the target? Uh, I mean, one of the big ones is the lethality system, uh -huh. where if you get hit with automatic weapons fire or a mortar round or an artillery barrage or a B-52, uh, you're not going to walk away from that mm -hmm. a lot of times. And similarly, if you're hit by a shotgun, you're not going to walk away from that. It's the same uh, feeling. And the ability to provide that extra level of lethality and mortality, that's something that ports over directly from uh, the Delta Green role-playing game. Another thing that uh, Greg put into the Delta Green role-playing game is a thing called bonds, which are the things that tie your agent to the outside world. So they're like their family, or their old uh, me uh, mentor back at the FBI, or their bartender, or their priest. and as you continue to fight the mythos, those bonds fray and fall apart. And Greg had a very uh, elegant system for that in Delta Green that I ported over into, into Fall of Delta Green. So that's a new thing, is the sort of ability, to, oh, look, I have ablative stability points that I can spend. Oh, right, that's what's keeping me attached to the real world. What a terrible decision that was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it really sort of allows that depth of, of trauma that I think is is uh, fun for just really personal role playing, mm -hmm. and that that's something that hadn't been in uh, in certainly hadn't been in Trail. Elements of it are in, in the new Fear itself, uh, but uh, it's not in Trail. So it was it was fun to uh, be able to take that and move it through. And then a lot of it is just you know figuring out. Let's see what are the what are the rules for napalm. We never had napalm rules. Now we do, okay. and they're terrible because <laughs> fall the green. Um. Do you have a message for the French gaming community? Uh, I hope you like it. That's the big one. Um, welcome to my little crazy world and uh, the uh, pagan uh, publishing crazy world back in the day. Um, I, uh, I, I, I encourage you to uh, make it your own. Uh, play Americans if you want. Play uh, French uh, Delta Green friendlies or make up your own agency. Do whatever you want to do to make the world and the game yours. I don't feel like me and Dennis and Scott and uh, Tynes have told you everything about the world, that the world is full of mystery and horror, and you should go find your own mystery and horror in books that I can't read. Um, can you pitch the Borealis connection a little bit and tell us about your plans for the, the rest of the, the game line? Uh, the Borealis connection is a linked campaign uh, that takes place. Uh, basically, it uh, came about because uh, we were thinking, what is a good sort of a world-spanning thing in the 1960s that's part of this universe? And we thought, oh, heroin trafficking, how great is that? <laughs> and so once you think you're going to do an adventure all along the heroin trail, from Southeast Asia to the Mediterranean, in Marseille and France, the French Connection, over into America, the story sort of like writes itself. And uh, I, I wrote the outline for it and turned it over to Gareth Hanrahan, who, of course, is magnificent, and it did the Zoologic Quartet uh, for us in Night's Black Agents the same way. And he have, it is uh, rapidly spinning my straw into gold. And so it's going to be a, a, a great campaign that I think is going to have a natural narrative spine to it and is also going to serve as sort of a globe-trotting campaign in the old classic, you know, massive Neurotho type mm -hmm. sense where there's just nothing but misery and terror all the way along the road. Okay. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, if H.P. Lovecraft um, were alive during the 60s, it would have been 70? Yeah. Around, around 70? 
do you think he would have joined Delta Green or uh, rather join Hippies at Woodstock? At Woodstock? Well, the last place in the world H.P. Lovecraft would have been was anywhere in the mud with young people. <laughs> <laughs> that was not his scene. Um, I mean, we all, as Lovecraftians, sort of like to hope that he would have maybe changed his mind about some stuff during the Civil Rights era, but I don't no, think I don't so. <laughs> I think he would have been uh, sort of a famous crank, you know, writing uh, segregationist screeds, mm. and he would have been full of bile and vitriol and awfulness, <laughs> and uh, people would be saying, would be, it would be in fistfights over whether or not, you know, that you liked Lovecraft or not. Uh, so probably we're all for the better that he died in obscurity in 1937. Uh, but if it turned out that he knew stuff, that his dreams were still giving him information, uh, Delta Green has tapped way worse sources than anything <laughs> Lovecraft. He'd be, he'd be an asset or a friendly, or they'd have him locked up in the Butler Sanitarium just like his dad was, and they'd just be, you know, paying his psychiatrist to uh, transcribe his dream journals. Okay, well, uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much for your oh, time. Thank you very much for um, doing the translation. Yeah, no worries. Um, merci à tous d'avoir suivi cette interview uh, et à très bientôt.